walk away from whatever the thing is, if you're like super frustrated and you've spent more than like 20 minutes on the thing, walk away from it. And the time you get your water or whatever it is you're going to get, it's going to be there. <laughs> the answer is going to show up in your brain. A lot of people think that they don't have experience. They're like, oh, this job is asking for this experience or this is, this is experience. Make sure that you track your experience and put, put your stuff up on GitHub and count that as experience. And I think, I, I think that's the job of the developer educator too, right? Is like to meet the people where they're at and, and make it, make it fun for them, help them find the fun and, and, and what it is there, you know, help, help them be yeah. successful. Hey everyone, this is Sean Falker from Huddle. In this episode, I talked with Craig Dennis from Tulio about developer education and training. I was really interested in exploring this with Craig because he's been working in the developer education space for a long time, has a ton of experience, really knows his stuff. And of course, Twilio is a company that's well known for having a heavy investment in developer relations and having fantastic developer resources and learning resources. And personally, I actually used to teach computer science at university. So I've always been interested in education and being an educator. Craig and I get into a bunch of things around Twilio's developer education program, why Twilio from a strategy standpoint has actually invested so heavily in this and how teaching developers might actually be different than teaching regular people. One of the big challenges he talks about is it's hard to meet people at the right level, especially, you know, if you're running an event and you don't know who's showing up, you can't go too deep with the newbies and you only boring people who already know those things. Craig has a super interesting background with prior experience teaching in the Peace Corps working in nonprofits and even being the CTO of his own company. I think this is a really fascinating discussion and I hope you enjoy the episode. Last thing before I get you over the interview, if you're enjoying Software Huddle, please remember to subscribe and leave a positive review. And feel free to follow me on Twitter, at Sean Popiner or Alex, my co-host, at Alex B. Debris, or our show is Software Huddle. Cheers and here's the interview with Craig Dennis of Twilio. Craig, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for just for for doing this. I know this is our second attempt at recording. <laughs> you didn't have the best Wi-Fi situation the first time you were on sabbatical. And yeah. I also appreciate you doing this. This is your first day back. So I imagine you got a million things that you're going on right now. But where in the world were you off to during your sabbatical? Yeah, so I was off in, uh, I started the trip in Guyana. And it's, which is in South America, a little tiny country, not very well known about next to uh, Venezuela. My wife and I actually uh, met there and we served in the Peace Corps together 20 years ago. Um, and then we went, made our way to Grenada after that and just spent three beautiful weeks in hammocks, just reading books and the dream, the dream, swimming, swimming, swimming. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Uh, but uh, now you're back working, uh, but uh, I think that's quite the, quite, quite the context shift. So. I want to give you a chance to kind of, um, you know, introduce yourself a little bit. We're, we're going to be focusing a lot of this conversation around developer education. You're a principal developer educator at Twilio. So what exactly is that role and uh, what, any other kind of background that you can give about your sort of way that you found yourself in this career at Twilio? Cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so a developer educator, we kind of uh, wear multiple hats here at, at Twilio. We kind of work, we, we dive into the docs and but really, our, our job here is to kind of inspire and equip developers to just be able to build. Like at, at Twilio, we're like super into letting people build. So what do you need? What skills do you need to be able to build uh, specifically here uh, on, on Twilio? But in, in developers in general, that's kind of where developer education is. It's like, let us get you the right amount of skills, get you just the right amount of information to get you inspired, to understand what it is you can even build and then get you going, uh, uh, build on that. And you've been in that space for, for quite a long time. How did you kind of end up in that career? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, um, I uh, started out in software development very, very early in my, my career. Uh, one of my first jobs, I've, I've only done it. I've only done this world. Uh, I say, uh, um, uh, and I decided to join the Peace Corps. Um, like we, we, I had mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, and when I was in the Peace Corps, I taught. It was the very first time I ever taught, and I, I was dabbling a little bit in theater and improv and that sort of stuff. I really loved the kind of the way I was using my skills uh, together on, on that. Um, and so I taught there, and I just, I kind of fell in love with the, the, the craft of, of teaching. Um, and when I came back from the Peace Corps, I worked uh, for a nonprofit, and I, I took a swing at like doing some CTO sort of stuff, running a team and that sort of thing. I really miss teaching. I really like, like, like deep in my core, like that's, I, I really miss that. Um, and this is like at the start of um, MOOCs. I don't know if you remember that or not, the, the like massive 
online open course or something like that. So it's basically like online education, like ed tech stuff. It was kind of just, just taken off. There's a company called Treehouse that just randomly happened to be in Portland where I was living, um, doing online education. And that was for people who were brand new to code. Um, and I applied, I put my hat in the ring and it was awesome. We ended up, I ended up, I loved, loved my run there. Um, and that's kind of how I really got into the game of uh, developer education there. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think like Twilio is one of those companies that's very well known for being a developer first company and also a company that's done a lot in the developer relations and developer education space. Like I feel like through my career, I've interviewed a ton of people over the years for jobs and so forth that have spoken about first getting really interested in programming or computer science due to someone from Twilio essentially showing up at their university or, you know, wherever they were and running an event or hackathon. So why is it that developer education and training has become so important to Twilio? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I, I actually, one that I, I love, I think that there's this, if you've, if you've never used an API before and you want to explain some, to somebody how you can use an API, I love the sending a text message, right? Like, it's just the fact that you can send a text message. So, so with Twilio, right, with a single API call, single line of code, you can send a text message. And that is magical. That's magical if you've never done something like that before. Like if you didn't even, I mean, it was magical. I was a developer. I was like, oh, whoa, you could just do that in a single line of code. Uh, and I, we do so much more than that. But like, really, I think that that little, that little way in there of also, you can also make somebody's phone ring with like a phone call, also very similar, small, small amount of code. But I think for um, developers that are new in the space, it's a great API to learn on. And in fact, we, we like totally, we, we believe that as well. We like, we, you know, I, I have a course out on um, uh, Free Code Camp that uh, is about introduction to APIs, and I use Twilio in it because I think it's a great API to teach. I show I show off a little Spotify API, and then I show off a little Twilio API because I think it's a really neat concept of like, oh, I I don't know how this thing works over here, but I'm just going to hit it, and it's going to do what I need it to do, and, and that's what I, that's all I need to understand. And and uh, yeah, so so as far as far as Devro goes, I think that that's huge. And like, if you think about like hackathons, like when hackathons are happening. It's really awesome to build a, an entire application where there's no UI because you don't need to waste the time on that. You're just kind of showing off what's happening. We're, we're seeing a resurgence of that actually with with all the AI stuff out here. Like, yeah. don't build a don't build a UI in front of it. Just connect the phone to this thing, you know. So, yeah, I think you make a really good point. There's something sort of magical as a an experience to actually like receive something on your own device, and it feels somehow like more powerful than just seeing it rendered on a, on a computer or something like that. Yeah. Uh, even in my time working at Google, I worked on messaging products there, business communication space. And there was something always really powerful about giving like that live demo of like, here it is on a device that everyone can sort of, you know, recognize and they can hold it in their hands and so yeah. forth. And it makes it feel real. And then also yeah. I, for Twilio, given, you know, when they started, I, I forget the exact, you know, 2000, late 2008, seven, somewhere in there. Yeah. Like the, even the concept of, APIs, as we know it today, was very different. So I'm sure they had to do a lot of investment in educating and training just to teach people that you can essentially interact in this way. You can do uh, something as crazy as sending a text message or making a phone call through essentially a simple API endpoint. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, like the fact that it's two-way uh, communication, uh, it, that it's an input-output device, like that's not, you don't really ever think about that. But like in a live demo of Twilio, I can have you text me and then I have your phone number so I can make your phone ring, right? So like that's that's kind of the neat thing. It's like text this number, you'll get a message back. And now I have a hold of your phone number. I'm going to run through all the phone numbers. I'm going to make your phone, I'm going to call you and I'm going to rickroll you. Most likely is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> And it, what does like Twilio's sort of developer education program consist of today? Because I mm -hmm. imagine it's changed a lot over time as Twilio's become you know uh, such a, a massive company relative to where it was you know a decade ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've built up a lot of products on top of uh, the little building blocks that were were set there. So there's the 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 Twilioverse, as we like to call it, is huge. And part of the the educational uh, process there is that hey, this thing is big we might already have the product that you're looking for, right? So like that's that's on our, our space to be like, hey, this is, this is how you might, this is uh, something that you might want to build that somebody else has already built. Here's a use case. Here's some some ways to think about this new input output device that you have. And here's here's some uh, 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 other things to, to possibly think about as well as here's some tutorials to go do that. Here's a, here's a um, 
a working application that we, you might want to dive into, uh, that sort of thing. So just kind of getting people oriented with our tone too, right? Like we're, we're, we're for builders and that might always come across, right? So we want to make sure that we, we still understand you devs. You know, you could come into this, this machine, but we still get you. And uh, we want to put you off into the right place of where that goes. So that's kind of like a little bit of a shepherding job in the beginning there. We, we have a program called Superclass that does that. So um, uh, it, it's been a rough year uh, in, in, in terms of uh, layoffs and, and shifts and things. Um, but we at one point had a video game uh, called Twilio Quest, which we don't we no longer have anymore with the with the the recent shakes ups uh, that we've gone. But awesome use of like, hey, come play this video game. It's this guided experience of how to go through and learn learn these different things, um, uh, and knowing that that exists, right? Like you might not know that that exists as you're coming in, just trying to learn how to send a text message. Oh, it does all this other stuff. Like that's that's kind of on the lines of of uh, how it is, and meeting you where you're at as a dev, like meeting you where. To, to get you move on to your next step. Okay. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, in your own past, you you first taught during a, a, the Peace Corps. I imagine you were teaching developers there. You were, you know, teaching probably regular school and regular yeah. classes and so forth. But now you've shifted in this career where you're combining essentially your engineering skills with with teaching and training developers. Is teaching and training developers something that's different? Do you have to kind of approach that differently? Uh, you know, are we... Do we just think of ourselves as different or are, 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 is the way that we want to be taught and the way that we want to learn actually different than something like, you know, teaching English? Yeah, it's, 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 that's an interesting, it's an issue probably. And I think, I, you know, truly uh, one of the hard, the challenges of this is, right? So we're, we're bringing in, we're also bringing in telecommunications experts who might not be web developers and then reverse. Well, you're a web developer who not, not, might be a telecommunication expert. So like, there's this world of jargon that we have to be really careful about. Um, and I think that this is true for all developer education. Um, and I try to hammer this home, especially again, like you said, uh, with, my, with my background, I know that people are coming in and there's words that we use that we just use freely and they might not be understood, right? And so like we need to figure out exactly, it, striking that balance is hard, right? Because you know that I, you don't want me to talk too slow. You don't want me to talk too fast. So like figuring out how to get your program to the right audience. Like if I understand what the audience is, if, if it's not just this free for all come to this thing, if it's like, this is very specific what we're doing, I feel like then I can talk at a certain level and I can educate to most likely developers, right? At that, at that point, if I've, if I've marketed it properly and I've gotten it in front of your face, I'm gonna say, this is a developer and I talk to you as if you're a developer. And that's really important actually, I think in developer education is to, to speak to you as a developer, right? You know, and say, I understand what you're going through. You know, we, whatever examples we're using, we're trying to use ones that you have probably run into or problems that you're facing, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of it comes down to authenticity and sort of being able to, to like have empathy and actually connect with the, the, the types of problems that developers might be facing because you yourself have faced similar challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to miss the mark too. Like you don't want to like jump in and start teaching something they already know about too, you know, like. Unless, unless that's where you're at, right? Like that. And so we also have a no code tool, which I think is interesting in this space, right? Like there's people, you know, they're, they're, they're builders. They're not developers yet. They haven't written a line of code, but they can build and they literally can build and do build on the platform. So they need to know what that is. So now, now you have this new other problem too, where you're like, you might not understand how all of the stuff works here, but it's been abstracted. So you don't need to understand what that is. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a challenging space, which I love. I mean, I absolutely love. Um, uh, uh, giving targeted, uh, experiences, targeted fun experiences, I think is like really, uh, awesome. It's, it's a fun part of this job and it's a, the challenge that keeps on, keeps on giving, you know, like there's, how do you, how do you sort of balance the, uh, essentially the different skill levels and learning styles that you may be encountering? Uh, you know, if you're, you're running even like a live event or something like that, maybe you might not have a lot of control over necessarily who's showing, showing up and you could have a fair amount of variance in terms of where people are in their developer journey. So how do you kind of like cater your content to, to uh, like address that variance? Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, question. That, and I think one that like we all kind of got pushed into uh, live events are, used to be great where you could take a little bot, a little break, right? Like if you're, if you're there in front of them and you're doing an educational experience, give a little stir, make sure everybody's okay. Maybe walk around and feel people as you're meeting them, as they're coming in. 
Now in this virtual environment, people just show up, right? So like uh, we, we run this thing and anybody could be here. And oftentimes it's supposed to be for developers, but oftentimes they're not. Um, and we've learned a lot of skills, I think, through this like live streaming. So all of the, all the live events that we do now that are like on these virtual platforms, um, I always try to keep the channel open, the chat open, and then have some people there to either support and then also kind of get a live feedback of, ooh, that was too deep. You know, somebody's saying something, somebody's asking a question, take the time to answer the question um, or, or, or take the time to, to put it into a parking lot and be like, oh, it looks like, you know, this is something that you want to do. I'll get you some resources afterwards on how to do that sort of thing. But, um, but, but really using the chat to kind of gauge is this landing or not um, in, a, in a live uh, experience. And in, in, other, in other ways, like making sure that you're building the proper prerequisites for somebody to be able to jump in at that point, right? And I think in sort of traditional like computer science education, there's often like a heavy influence on sort of the theoretical concepts and setting like, a, a, you know, baseline understanding or principles of how things work and not necessarily as much focus on the practical skills of like day-to-day -day development. And maybe this isn't something that you run into as much at, at, in your role at Twilio, but I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on like, how does do you actually strike a balance as a, an educator between sort of teaching those theoretical concepts so that people can really understand things at a first principles level while giving them like practical skills for actually like implementing and executing on these stuff? Yeah, I, I think that that really depends on the type of content that's being produced, right? Like if I'm making a course, which I love, I, lo I love to create courses, you know, my time at Treehouse, I learned, learned how to do that and the art of that. And I will open up and I will always open up theoretically and like let people know that, you know, hey, you can 2x this if you need to, but let's go through some of this theory. I, you know, I keep it light and fun and then go into the practical, but bring back to the, the theory. So in a course style thing, that is definitely where we go. I think more on the, when, when you're in more of one of these live events, especially one of these live events where you're not actually running a workshop, you're not, the people don't really have their lap, the people have their laptops out because they're watching you, but they don't have their laptops out because they're coding along. I think it's a little bit more of a little bit of theory. Here's me doing it. Here's what it might feel like if you were to do this, but you're not doing this right now. You can watch this later. You can come back and watch this later. And then I'm going to talk about some theory. And if you want to learn more about that, I'll include that in the notes that I send you afterwards. You know, so like that, that sort of like, I'm not hammering theory uh, onto you that you might already know. And at the same time, I'm not going to confuse you with, uh, I'm not going to overload you. I'm not going to give you a cognitive overload. I'm like, whoa, what, what is this? I don't know this thing he's talking about now. I'm just going to say like, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We're going to move forward here. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, depending on, I think, uh, the, the way that you're delivering it changes. Um, and it changes in the expectation of the, of the learner. The learner's like, oh, I, I'm just learning here this quick little tool from Twilio versus, oh, I'm going to learn how APIs work, right? Like, I'm going I'm to learn how this works. Is like, right. That's a different, a different vibe. Uh, but I always like to have, if I ever do like a just complete theory thing, I always like to have something at the end that ties back so you can kind of see like, oh, yeah, I did learn that. That's the thing that I learned. Yeah, I see. And then what about in the case where, you know, you, you might be um, either it's, it's a digital course or maybe it's something that you're doing live a lot of times when you're teaching, you know, uh, introductory in, into something, you end up building kind of like toy problems. Mm -hmm. But what about translating that essentially into like real world project problems or projects where it's going to be a much more complicated infrastructure? Like how do you kind of like set people up for success to be able to go from these kind of smaller scale toy problems that someone might be able to learn the concepts and learn the basics in an hour, but then be able to translate that into something that's like a real world project? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that we get them to that point, right? We get them to the point of like, this is how it feels. And if you were going to go deeper, this is the direction that you want to go. And here's the resources that you want to go to. We, we do a, a thing called uh, the code exchange, which there's like existing applications that you can kind of go and tweak. Um, maybe not fully uh, production grade or, or, or but we do We have a serverless solution. So a lot of them will, will work and then we'll scale for you. Um, I, I, that's just a new weird, weird world that we're in, right? Of like, oh no, this is actually going to be okay. <laughs> you could actually just deploy this and it would work. You press that button and now you have this thing. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think, and I'm not sure that that's exactly what people are looking for when they're, when they're coming in. Um, we don't get too much of that feedback, right? We don't get too much of that feedback of like, yeah, that's great, but like, where can I go from here? And we try to make them 
a little bit more than hello world, right? Like I try to, um, uh, for instance, one of the, one of the things that I, I, I always try to do is I try to keep it, I, I keep a, my improv history in here. I always try to make sure that like I've, whatever the day is, like it's like national hot dog day or whatever, I'll make a hot dog app and I'll be like, I'm working on this app. And then I'll, how do I plug Twilio into this? So you kind of see me in the builder stage of like, here's a web right. application. Oh, now it's a Twilio application because we could, we could do this back and forth. And I think that that concept does it of like, it doesn't matter what your web stack looks like, right? It's this, this concept right. is, is what's going in there. Um, yeah. And then, and then we can take it farther, right? So we, we have this concept of like, uh, we do these things called level ups and you can level up your knowledge. And those are powerful because I can say, I'm expecting that you know this before you get in here and then we can talk deep. We can talk about scaling and we can talk about uh, other sorts of problems, but you're not walking into that accidentally. You you very specifically hit that and that's the audience that, that we're trying to grab there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I imagine if you are in a situation where as an engineer, you're working on some like super complicated system that's using, you know, 400 different Amazon web services or something like that or services, then presumably you have a pretty like deep knowledge base that you're building off of. So you're probably able to make some of those mental leaps of how do I translate this, you know, smaller application into my larger applications uh, day job. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we always try to make sure that, you know, we take advantage of the fact that it's live, right. And we try to get those into the chat and we, we've been experimenting with, um, what if we just brought people in and like talk to them? Like we he asked the question, it is, this is really like, it's such a powerful question. If you're like, what are you building? If you ask that question to a group of people, somebody will come in and start talking and they'll start talking and the other ones will talk about it like, well, how are you dealing with this? And they'll just help each other, which is neat. I mean, I think that's the the developer community, right? Like that's just, yeah, just us like, oh, you're building? Oh, I love to build. Like, I think that that's a, um, uh, and I like, I like hosting that space. Like, let, let's, let's let you talk. You know, we, you, you saw all this stuff, your brain's running, a, a, running wild right now. And, and what are you building? What are you going to build with this? What could you see? So. Yeah, it's a good icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So what we're, um, you know, as you, you know, we're reaching a place now in the world where we're kind of, it's somewhat getting back to what we understood as normal mm -hmm. uh, in our life in 2019, you know, going to conferences, traveling, being able to do in-person events. But what was that like for you as a person who's built a career in developer education as you had to sort of like transition to, a world where you couldn't do those types of things. What were some of the the challenges that you faced and some of the changes that you had to make in terms of how you like educate and reach developers? Yeah, you know, I, I really, um, we really leaned into like what the Twitch streamers were doing, right? We were like, oh, how how are you? How are you doing that? How are you interacting? Because um, like, you know, like if, if I'm saying something in a classroom, if I'm saying something in front of a room of people, I can read the faces and I can't read the faces on this, this empty. All I got is this chat. And so if I don't yeah. have you working in that chat, I'm going to read that you're not paying attention. So like, how do I make that, keep that chat alive? And how do I, how do I make it feel like this isn't just another boring Zoom call? Like that, that was, that was the trick, right? Of like, like, how do we keep this thing fun always? Um, and, you know, Twilio is great for that because of course I can interact, right? I can build an app that literally you can call as I build it. And you saw me build it, like, that's cool. And you're working on it and now you have it at home and it's in your hand, right? Like that's a, that's a neat a neat magic trick that we just have, we happen to have, but I really find that like also keeping it fresh. If you don't do that, it'll like, we have people that come back. And if I do, if I give you the same show again, it's like, it's like going to see a comedian on all three nights <laughs> when they're in town, right? You're going to see the same show. And so you got to try to figure out how to, how to kind of mix that up. Um, uh, yeah, so that was that was hard. I mean, actually the reverse is true now. Like we're going back to in person we're like, oh wait, how did I do this before? You know, like we, we do a couple of these and it's like, how do, how do I make you feel like you're, you're working together here? I mean, but there's still nothing like, you know, when you, if I can make your phone, if I say, turn your ringers up and I can make everybody's phone ring and th there's nothing like that there the, or, or the laughter, right? Like hearing people laugh. So like, it's like, that's a good, a good knowing that people are on pace with where, where you're at. I missed that. And I feel like we found that through chips. Like that, that was a, a really good answer of like, are you getting this? Are you not getting this? Are you, um, uh, if they're not giving you feedback, uh, uh coming into, and then like, if your apps aren't work, if they're not responding to your app, that's also a trick of, so like this, like constant engagement through 
that I've, I've, it was been a, it was an incredible challenge and I, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed, uh, how do, how do we make this work? And I, and it was, it's been working. It's been, it's been fun. Um, we actually found that, you know, it's really interesting if you, if you record one of these live, if like we're doing this, I hate to use the word webinar. This is a good, this is a good, like it's different for, for dance, right? If I use the word yeah. webinar, it's different than learning experience or like whatever, yes. whatever brand so grows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want to go to a webinar. <laughs> so, um, uh, if we record them, people will watch them. People will go back and watch them in the same energies there. You get the same sort of feedback, even though they weren't there. And now, now they necessarily can't work with the, the things that you built, but they will still get value from it. And that was like kind of a nice surprise. And that's not something you get from live events unless you have them recorded. And in which case, nobody watches those. Nobody watches the yeah. actual physical live recording. But one of these like virtual events, people can watch again and get, get benefit from to a point where I didn't think that that was going to actually happen. Right. Like I didn't think that that, that people would watch it, but they do. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, in the sort of, you know, like webinar style, it's yeah. easier to do a recording that's going to, play better on the playback than yeah. in a live situation where you, you can't hear certain conversations, right. the camera's probably not in the best. And like, it, it, there's a lot of challenges, uh, uh, to, to think through and it just doesn't come across as well. Yeah. What about, um, how did you sort of navigate having t situations where you might have to remotely like debug or help somebody mm. in a remote s situation? You know, when you're in person, you walk up to their laptop, yeah. you can, you know, hands on keyboard, like point out what's wrong. It's a lot harder to do that when the person is across the world and the only facility you have is chat. Yep. Yep. Uh, so we, we tried this uh, structure and we, this is actually like, we took the live structure and put it into the virtual experience where we bring our solutions engineers uh, that we have on, on staff. We would bring them, uh, we call them teacher assistants and they would come and they'd walk around. They would do exactly that. Walk around, see, how, see what, what, if anybody's having any problems, like if somebody's raising their hands or whatever. And what we realized was if we brought that into the chat and then we also allowed for the ability for you to go and ask them directly that you could, but a lot of times people just ask main in the channel, ask in the main channel. And then like, if the answer is there, other people were having that problem too, with like whatever's going on. And we don't try to do too many workshop things. So like we, we, we really do want to just kind of be like, try to follow along with this. You'll, go, you'll get a recording of this. I want you to be inspired. I want you to know where the docs are. I want you to know where the tutorials are. But in, in most of those live events, we have people there and like, I encourage them to ask questions because, you know, like the, the best time to ask a question is the time that you have it. And, and so when people do that and they feel comfortable doing that, you'll surface a lot of the stuff that maybe somebody would have raised their hand about that that TA would have had to do six or seven times throughout, right? Because the, the frequent, you know, there's a reason why they're called frequently asked questions is because they are frequently asked. So like, if you can get that to come through the chat, it's a wonderful, like, it's a wonderful trick. And I don't know, I, I as we see as we're going back back to uh, in-person engagements, we'll see what what that looks like. I, I think things are going to be changed. I think the the way that 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 happens is going to be changed. We're definitely seeing attendance worse off. Like we we tried a couple live events and we're like, oh, well, where, why didn't people show up? There's like eleven percent of the people who said they were going to come. It's like, oh, because it was raining. Is that what happened? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've noticed that a little bit with um. Uh, meetups as well. I think uh, they haven't quite recovered, but I do feel like conferences are back in in, yes. in a big way. So maybe the the mediums changed a little bit, or maybe it take a little bit longer for some of these kind of more like deeper developer events to to come back. It's people get used to leaving their house once again. Yeah, um, right, right. Yeah, and then in terms of just like kind of looking back on some of the things that you've done in in your career, what are some of the like big challenges that you face as a developer educator and yeah. as somebody who maybe is thinking about, you know, either entering their career or maybe spinning up, you know, starting their own developer education program at their own company. What are some of the things that they might need to think through? Yeah. I, you know, one of the, one of the things that we recently, we tried to tackle this problem and we found this, um, again, we had, we had a video game, right? So we had this video game that you'd play and we'd found that people don't know some of the basics and that's fine. If you don't know some of the basics and you're just like ahead of yourself, right? Like people are learning and they're moving in the self learn pace. They're like, oh, I want to send a text message. Oh, I don't know how what an API is. So like, that's a thing where you're like, oh, well, that's a prerequisite that we could probably help with. Like we could probably teach, teach what that, what an API is and how that works. Um, or a web hook, right? A web hook like is a kind of confusing. It's kind of like a, you know, flip your brain around 
And if you've never used them before, and you might be far on your career, I, I really had to use them very, very much before joining Twilio. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a cool technology, but I sort of knew what it was. But like, if I'm just like, go do this webhook, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know what that is. I, what, what is a webhook? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And so I think that like, we have a lot of, um, we have the, a lot of assumptions as, as developers. And then as developer educators, it's really about like honing in on that. Um, one of the fascinating things that, that we found is that modern day learners, so new, new developers, they could be going through some of the analogies that we've built as computer scientists are not relevant anymore. Uh, the one that I love to use is the file folder. Like that's a thing, but have you ever physically seen a file folder if you're 19? Probably not. And, and a, or a filing system, like even like, like, you know, that sort of like, you probably haven't seen that. And that's fascinating because we're forcing you to learn that or, you know, you're going to dive into a file structure and it's got a folder, a manila folder, and it's got a, you know, <laughs> and so, so that's something to like, kind of like always keep your mind on. I think as a, as a developer educator that like, don't make assumptions, right? Like, um, and test your assumptions, right? Like, and it's, it's fine. Like iterate, like iterate and see if, if people are getting hung up there. And if you can, if you have the chance to get the little feedback loop going, if people know what you're talking about and if they don't build that, right, build that because somebody else is going to use that too. Someone else is going to, going to need that. You, you'll definitely find holes and you'll find, you know, like depending on where you're sitting, like if, if, if you're looking for marketing, that's a great place because you're filling a, a knowledge gap that's out there and people will get to know you and get to trust you and then also trust you as you teach about the product that you're, that you're working towards, right? So. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, even uh, like from an iconography standpoint, like a lot of our icons are just really dated because they were, you know, created 30 years ago. Yeah. Like the, I mean, I think it's finally starting to go away, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could find a, a floppy disk on the save button uh, somewhere out there in a modern piece of software. For sure. Yeah, there was a tweet. There's a tweet that said, oh, this is cute. Somebody 3D printed the save icon. And it was really just a floppy disk that somebody found, but they're like, oh, this is cute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and it, for people who are, you know, you know, companies that are interested in, in investing in the space or we even want to get a better understanding of how successful their own programs are, yeah. how do you actually measure the success of a developer education program? Yeah, I think I think that really depends on where it sits, right? We've I've seen this sit in as several different places. Um, one of them that it sits on, you know, like if you're if you've got if the the product that you're selling is developer based, it's super important, right? It's super important that developers know how to use your your application. So like uh, otherwise you're just otherwise how do they use it right like and, and how do you make sure that they're using it um yeah so so i think a lot of times there if it's on the marketing team you can track how much people who can especially if you've got um a lead that your you've, your sales team is sending people to go to learn about this thing because they know this is like a step in the process right you know you could you have a touch point right an educational a live event is an excellent educate is an excellent touch point that you can see. Oh, this made a difference, and this went this went forward. Um, you can also do a really nice. Uh, I, I found that the feedback loop here is great because you can say, "What did you think about what was taught? What do you think about the product?" Right? You can get some really good feedback because people people who have attended and are, are made it to the end of this of whatever it is that you're presenting, you've got a really good like NPS score, so you can see how they're feeling about what happened there, and you can also see. Get great, get some great information. We definitely send information uh, back into product about that, or or product will ask a question, and we can very specifically ask that question in the, the talk and see what what had happened. So, yeah, yeah. So there's a sounds like you know from a marketing and sales perspective, it's a could be a you know pipeline accelerator essentially, or even potentially lead generation from yeah. sort of you know like uh, from the developer standpoint or like a bottom up motion. Yeah. Uh, into, you know, product like growth and so forth, because you're getting yeah. sign ups and people using the API. So you're going to see those kind of growth metrics. And then you also have things like you can measure essentially how effective or how much people enjoyed the experience through things yeah. like, you know, NPS or CSAT score or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, if they returned, right? Like if, if you have yeah. this ongoing uh, uh, set, most likely if they come to another one, you, that you, you did it, you did, a, you did your work there and they want to learn more, right? So... Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. And then, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier on was this uh, sort of like video game uh, Twilio Quest that 
ha- had been used as like a training tool. Yeah. So that sounds like a, you know, very sort of like innovative way uh, to, to teach people, make it, a, make it a game experience. What other types of innovations have you seen in the space of developer education? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like when I saw that, I was like, oh, I have to work for that company. Like literally I work, I work here because I saw that like, wow, you're teaching through a video game. That's so smart. And it, you know, that comes with its, its challenges where everybody's like, why am I playing a video game? I could have played this at home or I don't play video games or, you know, they don't know how to move around with the cursor. Some people really didn't know how to do that. I was like, whoa, whoa, sorry. You never played a video game before, <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't land with everybody. Right. Um, right. I, I've been loving, I've been loving this new, like embrace the short form, uh, educational things, like the really quick TikTok-y stuff. I've been, I've been seeing some people experiment in that, in that space and be really creative in ways of getting you to uh, still have fun the way the platform intended you to, but also get exactly what you were supposed to learn from it. I think that there's been some really interesting advances there in ways that, um, you know, I, I've been, uh, I, I, some of the younger developer evangelists on my team have been pushing me more into that space to like play, like what, how can we play in the space and still be educational? It, it, it it's, it's fun and, and I think works, you know, I think that you can, you can grab people that, that really important attention that we don't have much of anymore. You can kind of grab it for a little bit there and maybe learn a little bit, you know? Yeah. I heard recently on a, on a podcast, actually, they were talking about how effective TikTok videos are for like life hack type stuff. If you want to know how do I get a stain out of, you know, this shirt where the stain yeah. was made with, I don't know, like edge and grease or something like that <laughs> then you can find a tiktok and then it's like super fast and consumable versus you know uh the challenge sometimes with finding that stuff on youtube is you can find a video but it's like 18 minutes yeah and uh like most of it's filler and then yeah. there's actually 30 seconds of useful material for something that's like as specific as that so i can uh, definitely see you know, some types of things in the developer world engineering world that could be a fit for that format as well yeah, people, the, there's a there's a trend, and I, I don't know, maybe we would listen to the same podcast, but there's a trend of people using that as their main search engine, right? Like, where do I want to go eat? Uh, t- I would never think of that. I would never think to go search that. But like, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe it does work that way. I'm not a, I'm not a TikTok user myself, but maybe I need to, uh, maybe I need to do some experimenting as well. Well, uh, if, if I introduced you into that world, I am sorry. So it, was yes. a, it is a lot of brain bleach, but it, it's good. It, it, there, there is yeah. a lot of fun in there, and there's a... People are doing uh, creative things in there. I think there's a lot of creativity, which I, I'm always like, like, oh, what's this? Like, so, so outside of some of these like technology innovations, are there sort of future trends in the world of developer education and training that you've seen uh, that are sort of emerging? Oh my gosh! You know the the thing I'm going to say is the AI, right? Like, so <laughs> so ask your docs, whatever. That stuff, like, you know, we, we run some hackathons here at, at the office and there's been like four or five people who have done that, have gone and like taken our docs and then you can ask a question and it comes out and it works pretty good, right? Like that, that works pretty good. I think that there's a lot of, um, I would love to see more of, um, I think one of the things that happens, right? One of the things that happens in, in this space is we never let people go back and assess themselves. They don't like get to do like any self-assessment. I think AI is wonderful for that. I would love to like say, here is a body of work that you just watched, write an assessment on that and write a quiz that somebody can take and self-assess. And they're not getting any certificate or anything like that, but they're just getting the knowledge that they understood what was supposed to happen in there. I feel like that's a huge space that is not yet tapped. Um, And there's a lot of companies who do that already, right? You know, like they'll say, here's this, here's a, here's a quiz after you're done to see how it's, it is. And then you can score your quiz. But I think you could probably just do that the same way that I can ask a question to my docs. I can write, I can take a transcript of whatever the lesson was and generate some sort of uh, assessment that you could do, some sort of self-assessment. I think that that'd be huge. Um, I, I would love to see that. I've been I've been noodling on that uh, on my on my sabbatical there. That was kind of one of the things I was like, wow, that'd be really neat to be able to tackle. Yeah, I remember some uh, even like. Uh... 20 years ago when I was in university, there was some uh, like early rudimentary attempts with some of that stuff. And it just, the technology just was not in the place that it is today to, to do that in a way that was not like, or that, that was, that's actually effective. But I think yeah. we're getting that into a place where with generative AI and everything that's happening in the LLM space that we probably can do that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, and, and that helps 
people who want to do, you know, self-directed learning where they can actually have those sort of feedback cycles to learn it uh, from what they're doing and even get better. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's like a, you know, on the, on the creation side of it, right? So we're talking about generative AI here. We're talking like, I would love to say, this is what I want to go teach. What are some of the learning objectives that I should be able to, to provide based on this or, or reverse, right? Like here's a, here's a piece of thing that we did that we didn't have learning objectives for. What are the learning objectives that happen inside of here? And you pull the learning objectives out of it just automatically. And I, I've played with it enough to know that that's probably possible. You know, with the right enough enough of the right tuning, you could probably do yeah. that fairly easily. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen anybody play it in that space uh, yet. But I, I am looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to that to that happening and like, yeah, I, I, uh, some of that uh, Syntasia stuff. I don't know if you've seen that, where it's like no. a, it's a video with like a talking head, like a, like like I do, but just it's all AI, and it's the things there, and it seems real, and the person's kind of like acting. Uh, a little, it's a little stiff, but like, it's impressive for what you need to do. You know, like if you were trying to make a nice video, it might be one way to, to do that, um, at a smaller scale, right? Place. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, in some ways it, it's interesting because I think one of uh, the, the challenges someone might have with, you know, being an educator in the space is maybe they don't feel super dynamic and interested in being on camera, but they still have aspirations for teaching. And yeah. you might be able to leverage the technology to kind of actually like lower the barrier to entry and actually make this uh, easier for some certain people or, or certain people who have a certain skill set that can contribute, but maybe they just don't want to be on camera. They don't want to be camera facing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like there's also like lots of um, extraction stuff too with the AI where you can like, I want you to look at the script and you want you to tell me what you might not think that somebody who was a junior developer would understand from here and pull those out and show me what that is. Like, I, it's just, just th that stuff. Like, and it really is like just any thought you have about AI and education is like exciting uh, as, as everything is with AI, right? Everything's just exciting right now. So in terms of people who are, you know, maybe listening and they're, they're you know, early on in a developer journey, <laughs> what kind of advice do you have for them in terms of, you know, things that might set them up for success or help them expand their skill sets. Sure. Yeah. And I love being in this space. And I think that like, it's, you know, if, if somebody is listening to this and you are, you're going in this, this is a fun, it is a very fun profession. And we have all been through whatever the struggle is that you are happening. We have probably been through that. Like it, it, we I think you oftentimes as a learner, you're like, oh, everybody else understands this. It's like, no, we hit our head on the keyboard too. You know, we missed that semicolon on line 11. We, we know we, we, the pain that you're having is, is, um, hopefully better, right? Like, hopefully you're not having the same pain that we have. Hopefully your GitHub copilot's helping you out. And it's not like you are actually learning the stuff that it's completing, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, I think just that, like realizing that, like literally everybody had to do this one time, like whatever it is that you're going through, whoever you're looking up to, somebody has gone through that and, and struggled. It, it is a struggle, right? Like it, it hurts. When you, when you put new stuff in your brain, it hurts. And that's like, that's like when your muscles hurt, when you, when you work out, that's your brain hurting. It's like no pain, no gain for your brain. It's like, it, it, it should feel like, oh, wow, this is, what is this? Do I get this? And then take a break. That's the other thing. Like walk away, walk away from whatever the thing is. If you're like super frustrated and you spent more than like 20 minutes on the thing, walk away from it. And the time you get your water or whatever it is you're going to get, it's going to be there. <laughs> the answer is going to show up in your brain. <laughs> Yeah, this, I think that's great advice. I, I, from my own perspective, um, I think one thing that helps uh, as well is uh, kind of picking a project that, you know, maybe is not too ambitious, but it's something that you actually like, like working on or is like something that's useful for you or is interesting. Because if it's interesting, then at least if you're struggling with the technology, like you can, you're working towards a goal that is going to be something that's, you know, fun or interesting, you know, like that could be a game or it could be something that's, but just useful for you and your friends or your family. And that really has an impact in terms of the level of engagement and commitment that you're going to have to, to, you know, it's a lot easier to do that than if you're, you know, trying to, to build some, you know, business application they have like no zero interest in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Find, find the things and then know that like whatever it is that you're building, you're going to reuse those concepts, right? If you have like a list of thing that goes to detail page, list of thing that goes to detail page is like 90% of the internet. Like here's a, a bunch of things click the thing you went to the thing oh do you like the thing oh now there's another thing 
And it's it, that same pattern is just over and over again. And whatever you're learning, like that's true of all the AI stuff and everything. You get get your patterns, learn your little your little patterns of all. This is how I might solve that input and output wise. And I think that like you. Yeah. And uh, this is the other thing. Um, a lot of people think that they don't have experience. They're like, oh, this job is asking for this experience, or this is this is experience. Make sure that you track your experience and put put your stuff up on GitHub and count that as experience. I would count that as experience, right? Like, like if if I'm if I was trying to pitch myself as a as junior thing, and they're like, well, first of all, this is the worst when you're like pitching for a junior developer job with like seven years of experience with React, and it's like, how am I a junior with seven years of, <laughs> you know, like so like, but but. But realize that you have experience and there's also experience in like business logic that you have other experience outside of developer. Like if you're a, a career changer, you're not just right, right out of the gates. You have some experience, even if even if it's like a, a job that you don't think is any related at all. Like if you're a cake decorator, there is there are synergies. I'll, I'll, use, I'll use a business word there. There are synergies <laughs> between uh, the skills that you have and what. Uh, might be helpful. Um, and you might not think about that. So like, try to think about it. Try to, try to always think about the fact that you are coming with your, yourself, bring yourself to your, to your projects. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, when you're, you're making a career switch or even if you're, you're starting out, it's, it's about storytelling. You know, how do you relate the experiences that you have or the things that you have in your life to whatever your new ambition is and what the, the company or whoever it is might be looking for? Yep. And uh, and I think showing that passion and being able to tell that story is matters a ton. Yeah, uh, when, when you when you get there. Absolutely. What is your thoughts on? So I feel like in the world of um, you know developers, kind of uh, in the early stages, learning how to code, there's often sort of two camps. There's this camp that uh, you know I've heard uh, Joel Spolsky talk about this, where it's essentially you know everyone should start out coding in you know C or C plus plus. They need to feel the pain. Of not understanding, you know, a memory error and having to dig into the details to really understand the machine at its lowest level before, you know, graduating to sort of higher level, easier languages. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's really like key. Basically, you need to weed out the weak early on. And then there's another camp that's like, hey, like, let's be a little bit, you know, more inclusive. Let's start out, we'll, you know, learn, I don't know, Python or JavaScript, something that's like a little, you don't have to worry about compiler, a little bit easier to, to maybe get up and running, doing that first program. And then, you know, when you're successful there, maybe you'll graduate into more complex tasks and so forth. What, what is your thoughts in terms of how someone, uh, you know, navigates that world? Is, is there a right or wrong in this? I would say if you can struggle through this, the C compiler, yeah, you're probably uh, set up to do this. But... If you go and you hit the C compiler, and you're like, this is all the programming is, and this is what it's about, and I'm not going to do this because this isn't for me, you're wrong, right? That's, you're, that's not what it's about, right? Like, anymore, right? Like, I don't, I don't feel like that, that is, there are, there are parts of this that you, you could like, and you're cheating yourself, I think, by making it in that, by not using the abstractions that exist. I even think that no code is a great way to come in and start playing around with coding, ironically. Right, like like understanding the structure and how how things flow and what what that's all about is an abstraction. That no code has given us, and you know I think that there's like all this there's a bunch of buzz around that about that taking over our jobs and things like that. <laughs> but I think really what what happened is like there's abstractions, and and if you can use the abstraction and it doesn't, you don't need to dive deeper. I think you're going to be okay, and like you should dive deeper when you need to. Right, if you run into something that you're not understanding. That's where you go and dive into it. But like, really, if you're building, a, if, if you're if you're working on a, a smaller site, if you're, if you're just getting started and you're working on a on a website, you're working on just like a standard website that that has displaying some dynamic data. Do you need to know how a compiler works? Do you need to know what a compiler is? Like, I, I don't know. There's a this there's this level of like that's that's where I'm at. And like, I I do see that as um, you know, I think that there's that's also the camp of like you need a degree to to do this that 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 camp exists i don't know i don't anymore I, I think that it's almost like your waste this is me talking i'm not the views i express might not be a part of my employers <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think that you're almost at this point four years dialed into a curriculum there's no way that that's up to date there's not 
Like that, that's just a plain truth. There's, there's no way that what you learn in there is still going to be up to date. And maybe that's where you're, you're jamming the compiler stuff in. Cause that still is, is valid, right? And that, that you are going to learn that stuff there. Are you going to enjoy that? Or are you going to actually be building the stuff that makes you think that I want to do this forever? Or are you going to get near the end of this and be like, ah, I don't know if this is for me. Wait, what's an API? And you're like a junior in college and you don't know what an API is yet on, you know, using a computer science thing. That's interesting. That's an interesting problem, right? So I, I'm right. almost on the other side. I think like if I, if, we, if I had to put myself in a camp, I would be like, do what's fun, right? Because this is a fun job if you can find it and you can find it. It will, it will be there. That fun exists. And, and whether that's the problem that you're solving or the way that you're solving it, you're going to find it. And explore. I think I think exploration is like huge in in this in this world. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that a lot of it probably ultimately comes down to the individual. Like you know, for myself, speaking you know from my own experience, I had a, a classical sort of you know computer science education training, and also very much was taught the the camp of like you know the world of hard knocks. Like <laughs> you either suffer through this pain or, you know, go uh, change uh, careers and, and pick a different degree, essentially. Yeah. But I have, you know, worked at, you know, great places uh, and with fantastic engineers that have all kinds of different backgrounds that have right. come from boot camps, have come, uh, started, you know, careers in completely different spaces and then took a boot camp, ended up at, you know, Google was a great engineer yeah. um, or people who, you know, started with a variety of different programming languages and stuff. So, I mean, there's probably no right path. It really comes down to the the individual and, you know, how much they get sucked into those, you know, I think wonderful world that that we've been sucked into of <laughs> being a builder, creating and, you know, finding passion within it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, I think that's the job of the developer educator too, right? Is like to meet the people where they're at and, and make it, make it fun for them, help them find the fun and, and, and what it is there, you know, help, help them be yeah. successful. Right. Absolutely. It should be, it should be fun. Yeah. Right. Well, anyway, uh, Craig, I want to thank you so much for for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for for jumping on in your first day back. <laughs> hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, this is a you know a good sort of conclusion to your first day back. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was fun, fun conversation. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>